they stripped him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and led him away to crucify him. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. From the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land. Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. His body was placed in a tomb cut out of the rock.
Good Friday uh, service at Fort Caroline Christian Church. I've always wrestled with why it's called Good Friday. It didn't seem like a good Friday for Jesus, for God, for the disciples. Today we remember the events that took place nearly 2,000 years ago, which changed not just the world, but it changed eternity. And tonight I want to talk about three people who were literal eyewitnesses to the events that happened that Friday evening when Jesus was arrested and then the next day when he's crucified. And these three, they didn't deserve it. You could say it was really improper what happened. It's unmerited, inexcusable, shameful, ugly, offensive, unbecoming, dishonorable, inappropriate. Whatever word you want to use to describe, it was just wrong. It was, ir, uh, it was re reprehensible what happened. It was an outrage. It was undeserving. They didn't deserve for it to happen to them. But it did. They just happened to be in the right place at the right time. They benefited personally while the innocent suffered. And although they were guilty, they received mercy and grace and pardon. And that's what makes the stories so wrong. They were there. They saw what was happening. They were witnesses to it all. They were part of the story. It's recorded in the Bible. These three people. Two of them are named. One doesn't have a name given. The first one's name is Malchus. He was a servant of the high priest. And his story is found in Luke chapter 22. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was praying with his disciples. He had asked his disciples to stay awake and pray with him. But the disciples fell asleep. So Jesus woke them up. And told them that a mob had arrived now. They had arrived to arrest him. And that's where the story is found in Luke chapter 22, starting verse 47. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up. And the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you going to betray the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. And Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and he healed him. And then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, to the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you would come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Malchus. Malchus is not named in this gospel, but in one of the other gospels, we're told his name. He was a servant of the high priest. He was just doing his job. I mean, really, was he that guilty? 
He was sent by the high priest to be part of the mob who came to arrest Jesus. But he wasn't innocent. He was just as guilty as the rest. He could have said no. He could have made his way out of the crowd. He could have escaped in the darkness. But he didn't. On that night, he experienced something that no one else experienced. Even while he was part and partial to the arrest and the eventual death of Jesus, who was the only innocent person there, Malchus received mercy and grace. You see, Malchus wasn't quick enough to dodge Peter's sword when Peter swung it. Swung it. When Peter took action. He may, he may have prevented having his head cut off, but he wasn't quick enough to have his ear cut off. It was brutal. He must have known immediately as he reached up the pain searing his body. He probably stumbled backwards, fell down, reached up to feel the damage, and probably horrified to realize that what was once his ear is now just a pulsating mush of flesh and blood. And he knew he would bleed out if he didn't get help immediately. With shock setting in, probably only able to hear from one side of his head, perhaps he didn't hear Jesus' words. He didn't hear Jesus demanding, it's enough, put your swords down. And I bet he didn't hear Jesus' calming words that I think Jesus probably would have said, it's going to be okay. I've got this. And Jesus picked up his severed ear from the ground. He must have felt Jesus pulling his own hand away from the wound. He must have felt Jesus touching the side of his face. And certainly he felt the healing take place. The pain disappeared and his hearing returned to normal. And if he wasn't in shock before, I'm sure now as he's sitting there realizing what has just happened, he was in great shock. But Malchus was not worthy. He didn't deserve it. He received mercy and grace at the hands of the one he came to help arrest, to lead away to be tortured and eventually killed. I wonder in the days and weeks ahead if he occasionally reached up and just kind of tugged on his ear, make sure it's still there, still attached, pulling on his earlobe and remembering that night. How many times through the years did he retell that story of grace and mercy? unmerited love now the second man he was a notorious criminal he had been the leader of an insurrection against Rome he was a murderer he had been arrested he was awaiting pending punishment he knew it was going to be death by crucifixion it was coming soon he knew that he had would be led to the top of a nearby hill called Calvary where he would be stripped naked and nailed to a cross. He would be mocked by the crowds while he experienced unbelievable pain. He knew death was certain and he had hoped it would come quickly. As he knew he would be laboring to breathe while being tortured to death, suffocating. Everyone feared the death sentence of crucifixion that the Romans had perfected. Barabbas. Barabbas deserved this death. He was guilty. There was no mistake. Everyone knew he would get what was coming to him. There was no appeal system in the courts. No slick lawyers calling for the governor to grant him a pardon at the last minute. There was no hope. But even the Passover tradition where Roman authorities would release a prisoner out of kindness in this festivities that they called Passover, Barabbas knew, they're not going to release me. There's no hope for that. He had led an insurrection against Rome. There's no way they would release him. He had murdered someone. And there's no way Pilate was going to set him free. But then the unthinkable happened. 
The story of Barabbas is found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15. And he's about to be given a second chance. The one who is guilty of sin would be exchanged for the one who had committed no sin. In Mark chapter 15, starting with verse 6. Now it was the custom at the feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually does. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate. Knowing full well, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have the Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then? With the one you call the king of the Jews, Pilate asked them, crucify him. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. And wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. You know that Barabbas had to be dumbfounded, utterly amazed. He knew that the, the crowds really didn't want him to be released. What few friends, comrades in arms that he had, they were out in hiding. They had not petitioned Pilate on his behalf, and they weren't going to. Barabbas could not believe what he was hearing. He was undeserving of pardon. He was guilty, and he knew it. And yet he received grace and mercy because of someone else named Jesus. We don't know the name of the third man. He is only identified as the thief on the cross, thief number two, if you will. Maybe the writers of the Gospels felt that to identify him would be to dignify his crimes. So they just left him nameless. His story is similar to Malchus and Barabbas because he too was guilty. But unlike the others, he wasn't going to escape getting what he deserved. He and another thief were scheduled to be executed that very day. And they were crucified on crosses to the right and to the left of Jesus. This thief would never think, think of it in these terms, but he really happened to be in the right place at the right time. Because you see, he knew he was guilty and he was willing to accept the punishment. He knew, I have sinned. And he knew right from wrong. But he also knew that Jesus was in the right while he was in the wrong. The court system, they got it right this time. He knew he was guilty. He knew they were just in killing him. But he also knew that they were mistaken in killing Jesus. He pretty much kept his mouth shut during the whole time of suffering, except maybe to cry out in pain. The other thief on the other side of Jesus, somehow he had found the energy to join the crowds in mocking Jesus. He he couldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. He could not ridicule an innocent man. The thief story is found in Luke chapter 23. One of the criminals who hung there, hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you were under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, 
I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't deserve it. Well, he deserved to die for his crimes. But he didn't deserve the grace, the mercy, and the pardon on his proverbial deathbed. The last minute, the final hours of his life, he received the one thing that he needed the most. He received Jesus. The pain, the suffering, the ultimate price that he had paid, that wasn't taken away while he lived on this earth. But he did receive unmerited favor that he did not deserve. There's really another story tonight, but I can't tell it. It's your story. I don't know your story. You know your story, and God knows your story. So let me end where I began. Let me share the same words with you that I shared at the beginning. This time, let me make it more personal to each one of us. You didn't deserve it. It was improper. It was ugly. Unmerited. Inexcusable. Shameful. Offensive. Unbecoming. Dishonorable. Inappropriate. It was irre. It was reprehensible. It was an outrage. It was undeserving. You and I, we did not deserve for it to happen, but it did. We benefited personally while an innocent one suffered. And although we are guilty, we've received mercy and grace and pardon. Why is it called Good Friday? Good for us. Good for you and good for me. As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper in remembrance of Good Friday and the sacrifice that Jesus made, I want us to start out with this video. some visitors here with us tonight and you may be unfamiliar with the way that we do communion, the way we do the Lord's Supper so briefly let me explain before I share a, a meditation here we have two cups stacked in the trays in the bottom cup there's a piece of bread and the top cup has juice and everyone is invited to the Lord's table as we take of the bread representing his body that was beaten, spit on, slapped, whipped, crown of thorns piercing his head, nails driven through his hands and feet. He could have stopped it. At any moment, he could have stopped it. But he didn't. He suffered in his own body for our sins, for my sins, for your sins. The juice, it represents his blood. It's, it's grape juice. 
but it represents his blood that poured out of literally every part of his body. Jesus said that a new covenant is going to be made between you and God through my blood. A new relationship is possible. And so as we take of the Lord's Supper, we remember Jesus, what he did for us. And we realize like Malchus and Barabbas and the thief, I don't deserve it. We don't deserve his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness. But I hope we hear Jesus' words that he uttered from the cross. Father, forgive them. And I hope we hear the other words. It is finished. It's complete. Maybe we can hear the words that most likely Jesus whispered to Malchus. It's going to be okay. I've got this. Will you pray with me? Oh, Father, there's really no words to, to say tonight that's sufficient to express our gratitude. We know we are not worthy of your love that you sent your son, Jesus, to die in our place to take our punishment. The one thing that would separate us from you for eternity, our sin. Not just a one-time sin, but sins that we do all the time. And yet Jesus took all of them upon himself, the only innocent person to ever live in full obedience to you. He said, I will take that punishment that they deserve so that they can be made holy and righteous. So, Father, tonight as we take of the Lord's Supper, we do thank you. We remember, we remember Jesus, we remember his body, we remember his blood, we remember the pardon and the grace and the mercy, the love, undeserved, unmerited, poured out on us. In Jesus' name we pray.
Would you stand with me? And I'd close out with these words found from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. It's called the high priestly prayer. And Jesus is our high priest. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Have a blessed evening. I do have one announcement to say that in the foyer there are some maps. If you're not really tech savvy and know how to use smartphones or GPSs or whatever, the Lonnie Wern boat ramp is where we're having our sunrise service. And um, it's Sunday morning at 7 a.m. And there's, there's some maps. I've highlighted the path to get there. So pick one of those up. I'll see you Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Coffee and some pastries. All right.